the reason for a land acknowledgement prior to my podcast is to acknowledge my presence on the traditional lands of our First Nations peoples. It was a practice by First Nations people when traveling through other nations' territories as a sign of respect. Land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes, which extends between Montreal and Fort Erie. It consists of three basic rules. Take only what you need. Leave some for everybody else. Keep it clean. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. It is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and this land acknowledgement is a small gesture to recognize the rich history of this land and so that I can better understand my role as a settler as well as a neighbor, partner, and caretaker. I stand in solidarity with the murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, transgender, and two-spirited people, and all those that fight for justice on their behalf. Miigwech. Thank you. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. This episode was inspired both by an individual's story of courage, but also by her work in her field of practice. Thank you for listening. This is episode 28. Great to meet you. I watched your TED Talk a couple of days ago, and I just thought it was so incredibly powerful. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. That's good to hear. I've listened to three of your podcasts. They're just fabulous. The content and what you're doing is so wonderful. Oh, really great. Linda. So wonderful. I just want to ask about doing your podcast. If there's anything you want to say about how it has been for you. It's a lot of work to do it. And I'm so appreciative that you are. And what you're noticing in the process of doing it. Having these conversations about subjects in a vulnerable way, because this is going to be listened to by various people, forces you to grow Mm -hmm. constantly. You can't but be changed or moved by the conversations that you're having and the stories that you're hearing. And that was originally why I wanted to start the podcast was I have a story of massive change. And in reaching that time of creating that change in my life, I was listening. I was acquiring all of those stories of people who inspired me to step into the change that I needed to make. And it was more the stories of those acts of courage, but acts of kindness and gratitude and all sorts of stories that made me feel as though I could do something as well. I could Mm -hmm. step into something that seemed impossible, but if I just kept moving forward and didn't listen to the critics in my head or in the world, then I could do what I felt that I could. The work notwithstanding, each time I'm changed slightly by each piece that's revealed. Thank you. I It was a selfish thing to ask it, but I have no doubt that other people will want to hear that too. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely surprise for me. And I suppose it's inherent in what you just said, the surprises that are there. Yes. In a process of just continuing to say yes to whatever you're saying yes to, and then who knows what's going to happen next. The purpose of the podcast is to talk about living a courageous life. Mm -hmm. And a big reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast was, and I don't know enough about you personally, to know how you show up courageously, other than the fact that you are stepping into a subject area and work in a subject area that is very confronting. Mm -hmm. Especially now, although as many have corrected me, the issues that we've been confronting since the death of George Floyd have been Mm -hmm. ongoing. This This has been an epidemic. Yeah. For generations. And so to speak about this is stepping into that arena of 
whiteness of what that means, what that looks like, and looking at the work that you do. But certainly, you may have stories of your own that you wish to share. Lisa Iverson, you're a sister and daughter. Are you a mother? I am a mother and a wife. There you go. And I'm a niece and a granddaughter and a lots of other things too, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> You're currently based in the Pacific Northwest. You have a master's in social work and a bachelor of arts in sociology and English with a minor in women's studies. You've been a psychotherapist for almost 30 years and you've been facilitating systemic and family constellations work for the past 20. Among other things, you've written two books, The first is called Ancestral Blueprints, Revealing Invisible Truths in America's Soul. And it contains your reflections on psychotherapy, truth, ancestry, tribe, and democracy. Your latest book, which I read and is called Whiteness is Not an Ancestor, Essays on Life and Lineage by White Women. It's an anthology of essays stewarded by you, and written by 12 women from three countries. And it prompted me to invite you to this conversation. Welcome to the arena, Lisa. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your invitation and the chance to be with you. You're welcome. I was so taken with that title. As we were speaking earlier, the process of stepping into the arena, being in the arena, in this last year has been a process of examining lots of different things, certainly people's individual stories, but the social context in which we're living has most definitely been very present in the conversations that we've had. And I wanted to speak to you because I was so curious about who is this woman who is in this practice area, how important family constellations work seems to be in unraveling this systemic racism that we cannot seem to address. What is the solution? We walk in the streets and we write letters and talk to our politicians and talk to each other. And then we seem to be unable to do anything other than just go back to the way it was. I I wanted to give the opportunity to talk about that because this is our, and I'm saying our as in white people's thing to unravel. This is not for black people or BIPOC people to fix it for us. It's ours to fix. So anyway, with all that, Mm -hmm. maybe we can start the beginning, I always ask the question of what was dinner conversation like in your household? What set you up for this journey of exploring this particular issue? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I uh, really appreciate the depth of your presence, Linda, to say everything that you're saying, and to be with the material that you encountered looking at this book that led you to us being here now. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. I'm a descendant of many generations of farmers, settler colonialism in the U.S., in North America, this part of the world. There's quite a lot of mystery for me about how it is that I came to be doing what I'm doing in terms of all that has to do with whiteness and race, the way that I make sense of it, what I do know is that maybe 15 years ago, I had invited a colleague of mine, also a teacher from Germany, a woman named Sne Victoria Schnabel, really wonderful teacher, constellation facilitator in Germany. And I remember sitting with her in a workshop and at the end having this epiphany of my ancestors and my experience in farming meant that we were always in a field. So dinner conversations in our household were looking over the cornfield 
or the soybean field. And here I am in my life. I'm not a farmer anymore, but I'm still working in a field. And the field that I'm working in has to do with the field of family history and ancestral memory and the knowing field that is in us and that we're in all the time that knows that everyone and everything is always connected across time and space from one generation to the next, from one part of the world to other regions. So (laughs) sitting in that workshop, it really brought great delight to me to have that sense of not only my own kind of embodied knowingness, understanding of the blessing for me, it was a real deepening of an embodied blessing for me, from my ancestors, to carry on doing the best that I can in the ways that I can make a contribution in whatever small way. It's different than putting food on the table, the way that farming allows us to do, but it is making choices about what's going to be nourishing or what's going to be nutritious for our souls and our psyches and our bodies and our human family. That feels like, in many ways, the opportunity that I get to have in my work that I do. In looking at this book, Whiteness is Not an Ancestor, Mm -hmm. what was the inspiration for that book? The last 20 years of the constellation work that I've been doing, pretty early on after coming into that field work that has to do with family and ancestral fields, it really woke up in me this connection between who we are as individuals and our families and countries' histories and historic trauma. That work was developed on German soil post-Holocaust, an acute awareness of the inheritance of the trauma of that war as a collective. Much of my work these last 20 years, I would frequently be doing groups that have to do with colonial trauma, the influence of slavery in people's lives in our country's history today. And that phrase, whiteness is not an ancestor, emerged out of working for about seven years leading groups in Atlanta, which was a total blessing for me, and accelerated my own kind of embodied sense of the way in which these collective traumatic histories live on. About a year and a half ago, a woman, I'd had the honor to get to know her over many years through this work, had invited me to her region in Banff in Canada, Sonia Lee. Mm -hmm. She's also a writer. And it was one of the retreats where that phrase, whiteness is not an ancestor, we use that phrase as the name for the retreat. And It was during the time of end of October, beginning of November, or Halloween, Samhain night, All Souls Day, All Saints Day. And I had a dream that night that for me I knew was clearly from the ancestral realms that when I woke up in the morning, this book project of this anthology was with me. It was a clearly delivered project. So I thought, about it for three, four months and knew it would be a significant project to do. And then about a year ago, decided to say yes to it. The pandemic started about the same week (laughs) that I had gathered the writers to begin writing. The timeline that I had set for the project was very specific because actually I felt very strongly, and it was in the dream too, but I felt really strongly about doing whatever I could to make a contribution out of civic duty for our last election here in the States. Mm. The stakes were really high. And for me, I have seen Donald Trump as our perpetrator in chief. He represents the colonizer enslaver from our American history we've not been able to claim. So it was out of this exclusion, our challenge as a country in the U.S., that for me, I've always felt like that's had everything to do with what has put him in office. And so I felt obligated in a good way to do what I could do. So the book was also my contribution out of my sense of citizenship. Mm. So I 
set a schedule of a 10 week writing project. So it began then just as COVID began, it ended, the writing ended on the same day that George Floyd was murdered. It just happened that way. Oh my God. The last year of all that happened in 2020, the schedule of the book, creating the book just all coincided. And again, that all comes out of what I understand in my embodied knowing around field, around connection, around mystery, around listening, really. There's a lot to listen to. So I do my best to listen and make decisions that are particularly big ones to make, but little ones too, from that place of intuition and knowingness. The creation of the the family constellations work comes from the Holocaust in addressing what happened, what was perpetrated during that time and how one can't just now say, we're going to just tuck that away. It never happened and we're just going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And it's just impossible to move forward from in the same way that we've tried to in this country, in Canada in particular, just tried to pretend that we as white settlers can move forward. Yes. Because certainly the First Nations people cannot yes. simply mm -hmm. move forward. They've moved forward carrying the trauma that was brought upon them. We mm -hmm. like this image of ourselves as being these nice Canadians and we do no wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet we've done horrific wrong. We've done horrific wrong. Mm -hmm. And we've continued to. Mm -hmm. We do continue to. Mm -hmm. And it's from, I don't want to believe that it's from a lack of desire. I just think it's honestly, I, I think it's embracing an ignorance of our history, of our real history. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. I wanted to take you back to the ancestral blueprints from your TED Talk and the use of the image of the waterfall. I thought those were two really powerful images that you used. Yeah, thank you. I, the waterfall, just I'm thinking about that and people who've not listened to that talk or heard that talk where you and I were talking about mm. life force being passed on from one generation to the next, like mm. a waterfall with all that's happened and all that hasn't happened from one generation to the next. If we're like you and I in this conversation, anybody who's listening to it, we're alive. That means we've received life. <laughs> so the, it, it's not about who is a good parent, not a good parent, this kind of a thing. I'm really aware of the time we're living in, particularly with my background as a psychotherapist, that the role of psychology has an enormous field of influence in how we think about family. And so I don't rule anything out in terms of the role that it has, the influence it has, where everything has a place. But I do think it's essential, if we're sincere in our attempt to address racism, that we expand our capacities in a variety of areas. And that includes how we think about family and how we think about the role and the influence of family in all of our lives. And it's in North America, I think, generally, because of how the continent was developed, how Canada, the U.S., particularly our histories as immigrant countries, the focus on the individual is completely unnatural. So it's one of the things that we need to expand how it is that we think about our humanity. The individual absolutely exists, no question. And the way in which we are influenced by groups is profound always. And the first group we belong to is our families. Now that's a lot to notice with a country in the U.S. that was founded on disconnection from family. So the TEDx talk, that's what the focus of that was about. I feel like this chapter of my life perhaps be a bit of a translator or a bridge person or something from the work I've been doing the last 20 to 30 years into other arenas. It's great. You're, you know, which is why it's so lovely to be with you. Your podcast is named The Arena and to be with somebody like yourself who don't know a lot about the constellation work, 
this is so important, I think, for all of us to have conversations with people from other areas to combine and integrate, synthesize our different perspectives, because we need them all, not tomorrow, but today. Yes. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? Without thinking about that any more than right now, I would say that I would say being born. Say more about that. Well, everything comes from there. <laughs> the waterfall. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you were born in a waterfall. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I would say birth, being born. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know what everybody else said. <laughs> It's quite a, quite an array. I'm sure. I'm sure. And what does being in the arena mean to you? Well, that's a good question too. I in this moment, it's being with you. It's here and now, but that feels also perhaps even when we say goodbye to each other today, it will remain that being in the arena. When I think of that, I also think about the gladiators. Mm-hmm. I think about okay, am I sitting there in the stadium? watching somebody eat somebody else or get eaten by somebody else. That is perhaps a little bit of the histories we're talking about and the task of addressing racism and the systemic nature of it all. The, there's a role, there's a group experience. It's not about a couple of people. There's a, there's a field there. I suppose everything I've just said, what I would say about what it means to be in the arena would be to be awake to where I choose to stand and the role that I have in the different contexts that I'm in mm. and to do my best to not be asleep at the wheel and to think it's somebody else's job to do what's mine to do, which is to pay attention to my own processes. That would be what it means for me to be in the arena is to be awake best I can to where I stand in relationship to all that is. The name, the arena living a courageous life comes from Teddy Roosevelt's The Man yeah. in the Arena speech. Yes. The context for me is, are you in the stands mm -hmm. and criticizing mm -hmm. and sitting back watching the other person working and fighting and dripping their blood and sweat? Which side of that are you on? Although I also recognize in your work that there's something about being a witness there's a third category of people in the arena. Mm -hmm. And perhaps being a witness in a present sense, I don't mean present as in time, but present as in being there mm. with that person, whether you're fighting hard or being the gladiator, you are with them in the work mm -hmm. that they're doing. Mm -hmm. What's your legacy? I noticed that. I must be aging because that question's coming up more. I'm hearing, I, it didn't used to come up. <laughs> and so I must have peers and friends, colleagues who are also getting older because like they're asking about it. I don't really, don't think it's my business what effect if when I'm dead and gone, people say, oh, she had an effect of some kind. That's not my business. Mm. That's the, that's going to be theirs. I want to do my best to live well and fully and contribute in a good way and receive in the best way what's mine to receive while I'm here. We're here for a blip of time in the grand scheme of everything. And so living fully is important to me. What would you do on your last day? I would do whatever I would do. It would be the last time I'd do it. I think about this question actually in a, with a little bit of a different phrasing, same concept, partly because of my work and experiencing the, both the resilience and the fragility of life and doing my best to really feel humbled. Humility is really a gift. And so it's humbling to be in relationship with all the different things that happen have happened and continue to happen in our humanity. And so it's led me to think I do my best to not take the people I love for granted, to not take the fact that I've got a roof over my head for granted and good food on the table, that kind of thing. And 
to have as much privilege as I have, to not to have home security, that kind of a thing. And so I think to myself, when I feel irritated with the people I love the most, I think to myself, okay, if I died today, do I want to die being irritated? Probably not. Being present and grateful is how I want to live my last day. The transition, my physical body ending, and feeling grateful for the life I've led and for the people I love and who love me, that I've had the deep pleasure to get to spend my life with. Any final thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up? A thought, an expression of thank you, speaking of gratitude for you, gratitude for your deep listening. A sense of encouragement, if I could say, around the topic of whiteness, the task that we face, I believe, I sense, as a collective, that it is a collective task to see the role that whiteness has had and continues to have in our humanity, that I want to leave our listeners with a word of encouragement that it's doable. It's doable, and that I choose to believe that our human family is worth continuing. And so with that value of life and value of family, knowing that our species is one human family, that we're up to the task of unpacking whiteness, the role it has had and has, particularly in terms of violence. That's why it was created. It was created as a tool for violence to prioritize some people having over here and other people not having over there and valuing life differently for some people over others. So it's doable, but it's a group task. It's not an individual thing. So we need each other. We need each other conversations like this and lots of other ones to do it. That makes me wonder individually then, as much as one can do the work, can do the reading, you have to come together with others in order to... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My primary field of work is not race. It's family. I came at the field of working with whiteness, anti-racism, this kind of thing from family. So it's just another word of encouragement that like if anybody wonders, how do I do this? How do I do that? I would suggest consider back to the waterfall consider deepening your commitment that it's possible to a generational landscape of your life. We're all the same in that way. We're all descendants. We all have ancestors. We've all had this experience of life getting passed on from one generation to the next. And for us to really do the necessary hard work, it is hard work. It's hard work. It takes a lot of different tasks, skills, commitment, energy, all these things. The question for me and my work with this topic has always been, where's the strength going to come from for white people? Where's it going to come from? And then the need of European ancestral strength and resource, there's a ton of it. Infinite wellspring of ancestral resource in European lineage that people can just allow that this can be maybe a seed planting or more sunshine water on the soil for people who are listening to this for that commitment to grow and to know that we're all worthy of receiving life. Once again, returning to the field and as a collective, as you have said, which is so important as a part of this, that it's not an individual effort. It's mm-hmm. really one of one of family and community. I think this is such a powerful book that need not and should not languish on the academics bookshelf. I really think that this needs to be reading amongst the public. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I found this inviting Mm. to the conversation, inviting to the exploration and the examination that is inherent in what we need to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so thank you so much for the work that you are doing and for assembling these women and for their courage, Mm -hmm. their collective courage in doing the work to examine their families, their history, their own sense of responsibility and offering that as an invitation 
to all of us to to do that work ourselves. So Mm -hmm. it's been a blessing to have this conversation. I'm so powerfully moved by it and, and by the work that you've been doing. So thank you so much, Lisa, for being on the podcast. Thank you. I, you're welcome. And, and thank you. It's a circle of gratitude, you know, how these things go. And I have felt this prayer in my heart that this book is, it's, it wants to be experienced that way that you described. So I'm really happy to hear that. What has made sense to me is that it's a great book club book. It's very conducive for that. And I'm on a path to figure out what I can do to support that happening more. But it's good that people know that. Order a dozen and get together with a group of people and read it together and talk about it. You're providing a lantern of inspiration for me with the podcast world, what you're doing. So really. Good. Yeah. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Happy gardening. Thank you yes. too. All right. Thanks. Be Bye. well. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. I offer an excerpt from remarks by then Governor General Mikhail Jean at the relaunch of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, October 2009. When the present does not recognize the wrongs of the past, the future takes its revenge. For that reason, we must never, never turn away from the opportunity of confronting history together, the opportunity to right a historical wrong. Thank you for listening. Please follow or subscribe to this podcast. And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I invite you to follow my blog, where I continue to explore how to show up more courageously. Visit my website at www.lindamclaughlin.com. I look forward to sharing my next guest story about hard times and hope. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in the arena.